London, October the 5th, 1973. Shortly after midnight, the phone rings in the home of Debbie Ashrov, an Israeli case officer handling an Egyptian spy they simply called The Source. It is the source himself. His message is simple. I need to meet the boss, urgently. Within minutes, Ashrov has called Tel Aviv to wake his superior, Zvi Zamir, director of Israel's intelligence service, Mossad. In just a few hours, Zamir is heading for the British capital. Later, in one of Mossad's London safe houses, Zamir meets the source. The information he hears is astonishing. But what makes it all the more important is the identity of the man delivering it. Ashraf Marwan was one of the best spies in espionage history. He was the perfect spy. He was not only clever and very, very efficient, but he was also very close to the information. He was a relative of NASA. He was the right-hand man of President Sadat. So, when Marwan told Zamir that the following day, at 1800 hours, Egypt and Syria would launch an attack on Israel, there was every reason to believe him. But was this a genuine leak from the very center of Egyptian power? Or was the source operating under orders, giving information designed to deceive? Someone like Ashraf Marwan will do nothing without orders from either the Egyptian intelligence service or the political leadership, from President Sadat himself. Hundred hours, Saturday, 6th of October, 1973. The holiest day in the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Egypt and Syria launch an all-out war against Israel. The target, liberating the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, territories occupied by Israel six years earlier in the Six-Day War. Israel is completely unprepared, its regular army outnumbered, its reservists not yet present on either front. So the question is, how did Israel, which scored such a spectacular victory just six years before in the Six Day War, permit itself to get into this situation of disaster? Uh, the answer is uh, the Six Day War, which because of the spectacular nature of the victory, Israel couldn't avoid arrogance, hubris. That lightning victory brought with it an illusion of invulnerability. Israel seemed secure behind a protective military curtain. And despite intelligence warnings during September 1973 of an upcoming Arab attack, the head of Amman, Israel's military intelligence, General Eli Zaira, was convinced there was nothing to worry about. Sadat's close relationship with the Soviets guaranteed a supply of military hardware. But the Israelis knew he had been unable to obtain the latest generation of attack weapons. Without them, Israel's military might outweighed Egypt in the balance. But ever since the humiliation of the Six-Day War, Egyptians had burned to see their country fight back. There was a devastating feeling of the crisis and defeat then. There was tension, there was disorder, including demonstrations and the occupation of Tahrir Square. Everyone wanted to fight back. The regime was accused of failure, and in fact, Sadat was heavily criticized. While people in the streets agitated for war, 
the most powerful constituency of all, Egypt's more than million strong army was desperate to show that it could fight and win against the Israeli enemy they had to look at every day, just 200 meters across the Suez Canal. The Israeli flag, I cannot describe the feeling. My generation knows this feeling very well. You know, stretching for 167 kilometers, the Israeli flag is up high on every kilometer, right before your eyes, all along the canal. I swear, it nearly turned the color of the Suez Canal black. I saw it black. And when I looked towards the desert, I saw it only grading from black to gray. Just so much depressing color. With outdated weapons and lacking the ability to liberate the whole of Sinai in a military operation, in February 1971, less than four months after taking power, Sadat offered a peace deal if the Israelis would withdraw from Sinai. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir rebuffed the offer. Why should I believe now, after this experience, that anybody, under any circumstances, can assure us of something more tangible now than we had in the past? For Israel then to give up the Sinai would have probably been an impractical thing to achieve. Unfortunately, sometimes it really does take a military offensive to change perceptions and negotiating postures. So war it had to be. But Sadat had a bold idea in mind. Could a limited war bring the attention of the world's superpowers back to the region and jumpstart stalled peace initiatives? It was a plan developed by his chief of staff, Saad al-Shazli. We can cross the Suez Canal with infantry troops, stop at 10 to 15 kilometers, advancing our air defenses to the west bank of the canal, which gives us an anti-aircraft umbrella for 15 kilometers east of the canal. At that point, I stop, even if the enemy withdraws, because the enemy has one of two options, either confront, in which case I can inflict huge losses, or stop through fear of those big losses. As he contemplated a limited war, Sadat found an ally. Hafez al-Assad had come to power in Syria in 1970 through a coup d'etat. He too had points to prove to his people. We should not forget that Hafez al-Assad was the defense minister during the 1967 defeat, and he was mainly held accountable, because you cannot exonerate the defense minister for such a defeat to the Syrian army. So when Hafez al-Assad came to power in Syria, he started to absolve himself of the 1967 defeat and to prepare the Syrian army for the next battle. But when would that be? No one knew. In a series of meetings throughout 1973, Sadat and Assad refined the war plan. It was given the code name Bedr, after the Prophet Muhammad's first victorious battle against the non-believers. When they met in Syria in late August, an auspicious date was chosen. On the 6th of October, the 10th day of Ramadan, the Muslim holy month, the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur, Egypt and Syria would launch a surprise attack against Israel. But first, a setback in the air unintentionally served to disguise their build-up and confuse the enemy. On the 13th of September, Israeli and Syrian jets clashed over the Mediterranean. 
the dogfight ended with the Syrians losing 13 aircraft, the Israelis only one. Afterwards, when the Syrian forces started building up, we thought that in their opinion we deserved some sort of retribution and that the build-up was because of that. As Syrian troop concentrations in the Golan grew, to the south on the Suez Canal, there were clear signs of something similar. The Egyptian army was getting stronger and constantly exercising. I saw them raising the sand ramps on their side higher, even higher than ours, and opening gaps and getting into the water, measuring the depth, carrying out all sorts of exercises. We informed the high command, but they said, don't worry, these are just standard Egyptian army exercises. Only five months previously, the Israelis had responded quickly to a similar build-up. They'd mobilized their reserves, only to find that the Egyptians had gone no further than the edge of the Suez Canal. This time, Amman, Israel's military intelligence, was determined not to make the same costly mistake. In a document that Amman published at noon of October 5th, it was a perfect description of the Egyptian army ready to go to war. The bottom line was, we nevertheless believe that there was no change in the Egyptian estimate regarding the balance of forces with the IDF, and therefore the likelihood for war is low. But all that was about to change. That same night in London, Ashraf Marwan, Gamal Abdel Nasser's son-in-law and Sadat's information secretary, would tell Israel's intelligence chief that the attack would begin at 1800 hours the next day. At 0800 hours on the 6th of October, the Israeli cabinet met an emergency session. Instead of attending Yom Kippur prayers to ask forgiveness for their sins, they had been summoned by the threat of imminent war. There was an argument that broke up in the leadership of Israel, whether to mobilize the whole reserves or not. The Minister of Defense was at the time Moshe Dayan. His points were the following. If Israel will mobilize her reserves, then Egypt and Syria may claim that it is Israel that intends to attack them. And they felt that we have to make it clear that Israel was attacked and not Israel is attacking. In spite of Diane's opposition, at 0900 hours, the cabinet decided on immediate mobilization of Israeli reserves. Meanwhile, on this holiest of holy days, Israeli soldiers on the front lines fasted and prayed. But their calm was to be interrupted with news of the upcoming war. Ironically, across the canal, Egyptian troops were given their first warning of war at exactly the same time. They were to break their Ramadan fast and prepare for battle. But the attack would come earlier than the Israelis had been led to believe. The battalion commander gathered us. He said, break your fast. We laughed. But he distributed tea and dates, and we broke our fast. When we broke our fast, we felt the dread. There is no one who doesn't feel fear. He said today, at 2 p.m., God willing, either we avenge or we go in vain. The chief of staff, Saad al-Shazli, issued us with guidebooks. It was an important document to every officer and soldier, dictating where you'll be, where you will cross, the raft and its number, who's on your right and on your left, the content of your duffel bag, and everything. It was wonderful. In an operation they had rehearsed many times over the past six years, five Egyptian infantry divisions would storm across the Suez Canal. Codenamed Dovecot, 
the Israeli defense plan was based on the 15 strong points of the Barlev line. Manned by just 450 men, these forts would be supported by bringing 100 tanks of the Sinai Armored Division into position on the waterline. Enough, it was thought, to foil any Egyptian attempt to cross the canal. Dovecot would be triggered two hours before the start of the battle, and that would be at 6 p.m. They knew that from Ashraf Marwan, the source. It had an effect, yes, yes. It led primarily to a situation where there were no tanks in the positions in the Egyptian front because the commander of the Salman command gave an order not to move any tank to the positions before four o'clock in the afternoon. He was certain, like everyone else, that war will start at six. In 2002, I exposed, I unmasked Ashraf Marwan. And when I did it, it was Ashraf Marwan, the Egyptian national hero because in my view, he was a double agent, and in fact, he was the jewel in the crown of the Egyptian deception plan before 1973. October 6th, 1400 hours, war. Two hundred and twenty jets of the Egyptian Air Force crossed the Suez Canal, heading for Sinai. Their targets? Israel's command centers, airfields, and anti-aircraft batteries. Flying at the altitude of five kilometers, I was looking at Sinai. An explosion here, another there, the Israeli anti-aircraft missiles targeting our planes, and our planes striking at their missile sites. You know what? It was like a wedding with fairy lights, lights flashing on and off, a beautiful scene. Sinai looked almost joyful. The Egyptian aircraft returned to their airfields after destroying their targets for the loss of just eight planes. But one of their first casualties was significant. President Sadat's brother. Atif Sadat was my classmate. We never felt he was the president's brother or anything like that. He looked like a movie star. Alain Delon, with fair hair, green eyes, so elegant and so manly. And he topped us all in piloting and in knowledge, but because of his competence, not his brother. Within minutes of the first aerial attacks, a massive artillery barrage begins. Twenty minutes after zero hour, under cover of the continuing artillery fire, the first wave of Egyptian ground troops crossed the canal. 4,000 men and 720 rafts. Praise be to God. We found ourselves on the other bank. Can you imagine? We climbed the sand wall, a 20 meter high sand wall, not just three or four, but 20. The soldiers were climbing all over it like butterflies. With the war half an hour old, Dovecot, the Israeli defense plan, is rushed into action. Tanks begin their move towards the canal from where they've been dug in, five kilometers to the east. When the Egyptian infantry got across, first got across the canal, they kind of knew how the Israelis would respond. They uh, had the new 83 Saga anti-tank missile. These infantry portable missile systems, uh, they were certainly new to the, uh, to the theater, uh, and they uh, proved very effective against the Israeli armor. I had 
I had a million questions. Does the missile have enough destructive power? But with the first missile and the first tank, that answered everything for me. In this war, a new lesson emerged from the Egyptian special forces and infantry, that a single soldier can now take a tank out of battle. The previously mighty tank, it was a lesson that was noticed all over the world. Three hours into the war, 45 Egyptian infantry battalions formed of 32,000 men have crossed the canal. The forts of the Barlev line have been taken or besieged. Most of the Israeli tanks have been destroyed. Dovecot has failed. At the end of the day, we had just two tanks left of my battalion, along with my armored personnel carrier. So then they notify me that there's a brigade on its way to me and that the brigade commander, Gabi Amir, asks, where is the battalion? And I say, this is the battalion, and laugh. He knows me and knows that I joke around sometimes. And I said to him, no, Gabi, this is the battalion. After the first wave of Egyptian infantry has made the canal crossing, 35 battalions of engineers follow. The engineers crossed with the second wave. They put the pumps together, fixed the hoses, and started to point them at the sand wall. It started falling down. This was a big breakthrough, as opening up passages enabled us to operate the ferries and move some equipment across, especially the battalion's artillery and the weapons needed to stop any counterattack by the enemy on the eastern side. The next phase of the engineers' work was to erect pontoon bridges for the tanks and heavy weapons. By sunrise on day two, it looked as if the war had been an unequivocal success for Egypt's armed forces. 100,000 men, more than a thousand tanks, and over 10,000 other vehicles had crossed the Suez Canal with only minimal losses. The Egyptian army came away from the 1967 Arab-Israeli war ashamed of itself. And in 1973, the Egyptian army proved that it was capable of military success and military victory. That was very important to the Egyptians as a fighting force because it proved to them that they themselves could succeed. At 1400 hours on October 6, 1973, Yom Kippur, sirens sounded across Israel. It was war, again. The one memory I have from the 1956 war was hearing air raid sirens at night and my father wrapping me in a thick blanket and running with me to the shelter. On Yom Kippur, at two in the afternoon, we heard the siren and I did the same thing. I took the very same blanket, wrapped my six-month-old son up in it. I ran with him to the shelter. And that was the first time that I knew there was a war going on. At the same time as Egypt was crossing the Suez Canal, 
in the Golan Heights to Israel's north, Syria joined the fray. I turned to President Assad and said, it is time. He said, with God's blessing, we start. I picked up the phone and gave the operation code. It was Bedr, 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 Bedr. Bedr, Bedr. 150 Syrian jets started the war with a massive aerial strike on Israeli positions in the Golan. Minutes later, a thousand artillery pieces opened fire, paving the way for the ground assault. Three Syrian infantry divisions, formed of 40,000 troops and 600 tanks, crossed the Purple Line, the ceasefire line after the 1967 war. Two hours into the war, the Syrians gained their first significant victory when they captured Israel's eye a key Israeli vantage point, 2,000 meters above sea level, on top of Mount Hermon. The Syrian paratroopers who carried out the operation advanced first on foot. Then another unit was dropped by helicopters onto Mount Hermon, and both units were able to capture the Israeli forces who surrendered to them. Then they raised the Syrian flag on Mount Hermon, and that was the best news we received during the first hour. The Syrian paratroopers were joined by a unit of Palestinian commandos. You cannot imagine the feeling. You are now recapturing something from the Israelis for the first time. The battle for the outpost lasted only 45 minutes. 13 Israeli soldiers were killed, 31 taken prisoner. They captured the outpost and had with them Russian and East German experts who dismantled all the equipment at the outpost. Actually, they passed by us, carrying the equipment from the outpost, which had belonged to the Israeli army. Facing the massive Syrian ground assault was an outnumbered Israeli defensive line, guarded by 200 Israeli soldiers in 10 outposts, and two armored brigades, numbering almost 180 tanks. I looked up and I saw dust tracks coming from the east, and it was, of course, tanks coming towards us. As they advanced, it began to get dark, so we started shooting at them from very long range, four or five kilometers, and we tried to stop their advance. Then, just as they were getting close enough that we were starting to hurt them, darkness fell. By nightfall on day one, Pushing through unguarded holes in the Israeli line, Syrian tanks would penetrate into central Golan, around the key city of Qunaitara, capital of the occupied heights. The second big news came with the breakthrough of the 7th Division into the outskirts of Al Qunaitara. The third success was when the 9th Division reached Al Khashniya. That's a town named Al Khashniya, south of Al Qunaitara. It meant that Al Qunaitara was encircled from many sides, and that was very good news. Yet more Syrian tanks had now advanced into southern Golan, forming a bulge and recapturing a large part of the strategic heights. By midnight, the Syrians had made major gains, but now, Strangely, the order came to stop the advance and regroup for another assault in the morning. Before them, the roads stretching down to the Jordan Valley and the heart of Israel lay undefended. Just a few kilometers to the east, on the edge of the Golan, were positions which, had they been taken, would have been virtually impregnable. It's clear that the Syrian army did not permit junior commanders' discretion in how to act. 
and regardless of which senior person was in control in Damascus, nobody felt that they could decide to continue without the approval from Damascus. President Hafez al-Assad was controlling the Syrian army with an iron grip. No one was allowed to act outside the original plan. He lived with us. He had a bedroom at the command center. He slept there. And when he woke up, he used to salute us and take his place behind the operations desk. He was always there in the command center or in his room in the same place. Within hours, almost a quarter of a million Israelis would be mobilized. These reservists were vital support. Without them, the regular forces were facing a huge Arab numerical superiority. The Syrians had calculated it would take the Israeli reserves 24 hours to reach the Golan. In fact, the first tanks were there by midnight at the end of day one, just 15 hours after they had been mobilized. This nine-hour difference was to prove crucial. Essentially, once the Syrians fail to take it in 24 hours, then at that stage, you have the Israelis beginning to really organize themselves, and a Syrian victory becomes increasingly less likely uh, as, as, as Israel is mobilized. At first light on day two, Syrian tank commanders could see 15 kilometers west down to the Sea of Galilee and the city of Tiberias. But also in their sights, Israeli tanks that simply shouldn't have been there. The Syrians began to lose the war. They didn't know this yet because the reserve tanks, like my brigade, started being ready after just 15 hours instead of 24. Some of them went out alone, but mainly they started to take over from the regular forces during the night combat between October 6th and 7th. Shortly after dawn, ignoring the fact that the Israelis had successfully mobilized to meet them, the Syrians launched their planned tank assault. Their main target was Nefakh, the Israeli advanced command center and the strategic crossroads that controls the Golan. After capturing Nefakh, the Syrians would move westwards towards the Benot Yaakov bridge over the Jordan River. The bridge was less than 15 kilometers away and beyond it lay the Israeli mainland. The Israelis were on the verge of disaster. We suddenly started shooting at the Syrians from three or four different directions. We fired and the Syrians were stopped. Some of them managed to bypass Nafakh, but we beat the Syrians here, and it was here that a battle that had lasted till the night of October 7th finally ended. The Israelis managed to stop the Syrians, but paid a heavy price in men and tanks. On top of the casualties, the commander of the 188th Armored Brigade, Colonel Yitzhak ben Shaham, was killed along with his deputy and operations officer. Having failed in his main objective to take the Israeli forward base at Nafakh, in his Damascus command bunker, President Assad's decisions were looking increasingly desperate. At one point, a brigade was ordered to attack. I gave the order to the commander. Being aware of the situation on the battlefield, he asked me to postpone the attack from 6 in the morning to make it 10. I took this request from the brigade commander to the president. I told him he's asking to postpone the attack until 10. The president became angry. He said he must start the attack at 6 o'clock, otherwise he can hand over to his deputy. I tried to ease the tension, and then I made the suggestion again. I said, there is no difference between 6 and 10, except that around 2,000 of our troops will be killed, so please approve 10. But he became even more angry and hit the table with his fist. 
وضرب بيدي على الطاولة On days three and four, faced with a series of deadlocks, Assad simply repeated the strategy that had previously failed to achieve a breakthrough. In a desperate throw of the dice, two further armored divisions, numbering 500 tanks, were brought forward to compensate for the losses of the first two days. We stood there and shot like madmen, me included. I was in my own world aiming at the tanks heading towards us, shooting down the first, second, third, fourth. I hit some 20, 25 tanks, and everyone, everyone took aim and shot and shot and shot. In northern Golan, in a place that became known as the Valley of Tears, by the end of day four, the Israelis had destroyed hundreds of Syrian tanks. The same fate befell the 1st Syrian Armoured Division during repeated attempts to capture Nefakh. I think that today, looking back 40 years, the Battle of Nefakh, when the Syrian 1st Division decided to withdraw and not complete its mission to get to the Jordan Valley, that was the critical stage in the battle to defend the Golan Heights. Avigdor Kahalani and Tzvika Greengold would both receive the Medal of Valor, Israel's highest military decoration. But this Israeli victory was not won by bravery alone. One tank is sometimes better than another. So one Israeli tank can destroy 20 Syrian tanks. Because if a tank that can fire, hit, and destroy at a range of 2,000 meters faces 50 tanks with guns with a range no greater than 1,500 meters, with simple math, one tank can destroy all the other tanks whose shells cannot reach it. It's just a matter of technical excellence, not competence in combat. I don't deny the courage of the Syrian officers and soldiers, but unfortunately, Israel had better tanks. On the morning of the 9th of October, the Israelis launched their counter-attack. Moving north from the Jordan Valley, they opened fire on Syrian tanks in South Golan pushing them back before the onslaught. By the following morning, the Syrian threat had been neutralized, two-thirds of their tanks destroyed or abandoned on the battlefield. The Syrians were in full retreat, back where they had started before hostilities began. The Syrians were overtaken by enthusiasm during the first two days, thinking they could overpower Israel. That meant taking over the Golan and approaching occupied Palestine. They thought they could end the war, but they overstretched themselves and lost a lot of tanks during those first three days. However, in Sinai to the south, the Egyptians had used their success on day one to secure defensive bridgeheads. With two field armies dug in across the canal, the second in the north and the third in the south, they were prepared for the inevitable Israeli counterattack. These convoys of armored track vehicles will be moving up the road out of Israel towards the Sinai Desert. This is the beginning of the desert now. We're told that another convoy of by the end of day two, two of Israel's most famous generals, Ariel Sharon and Avraham Adan, had arrived at the Suez front, each with an armored division of over 300 tanks. They were ready to launch a carefully planned counterattack. Adan's division to the north would sweep south to expel the Egyptian Second Army from its bridgehead. 
Then, once Adan had pushed the Egyptians back across the canal, Sharon's division would move against the Egyptian Third Army to repeat the process in the south. At 0900 hours on October 8th, the attack began. Suddenly, we see the tanks of our brothers moving, moving in the plain, but it's not a division which is moving, just little forces of tanks. It's not a divisional attack. It's not in the right direction. Instead, from north to south, they come through us from east to west. And we see just before our eyes a terrible enemy fire, shells in the desert, box of fire around any tank. Boom. We received orders to fire. We fired at them with every weapon we had. It was a massacre, a massacre. All sorts of weapons, the anti-tank Saga missiles, RPGs. The Egyptian RPG soldiers were moving like birds, like birds, jumping from one tree to another. They would hide behind the ram till the tank was 50 meters away and within range. Then they fired at it. They would knock that one out, then move on to the next tank. I was a tank company commander in the Six Day War, and I fought on Sinai's northern road. This time, I faced completely different soldiers, soldiers who were much more determined, soldiers who were certainly different from what I saw in the Six Day War, in the very same place. <laughs> We are able not only to finish this, but to continue and uh, to give the Israeli army another beating as has been done. Israel's initial counterattack had failed. And after losing 50 of his tanks, Adan ordered his forces to fall back to defensive positions. Worse still, in terms of prestige, Israeli tank crews had been taken prisoner of war, including a tank battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Asaf Yaguri. For the first time in its 25-year history, Israel was on the defensive, sustaining heavy casualties and unable to achieve the superiority of 1967, on land or in the air. In the Six-Day War, it had dominated the skies. But now, the Israeli Air Force found itself facing a wall of surface-to-air missile batteries, employing the latest Soviet SAM technology. They built an anti-aircraft system, which was among the best and most effective in the world. They inched their missiles towards the canal, and even transferred some of the lighter missiles to the other side. And of course, it was an effective anti-aircraft system. That, I must admit. To achieve air superiority, the Israelis had to try to knock out Egypt's Sam wall. But the missile defenses took a heavy toll of the attacking aircraft. By day four of the war, Israel had lost 48 planes, an eighth of its entire air force. I fired 31 missiles and downed 16 aircraft. That's 1.8 missiles for each target. That's a record, because the ratio is supposed to be two or three missiles for each plane. I really don't know. I was flying and my airplane exploded suddenly. I don't remember my parachute. It exploded and I woke up in a car, in an Egyptian car. As the first week of conflict ended, 
Israel suffered another serious blow. On the 13th of October, in front of the world's media, the last of Israel's Barlev line of fortresses surrendered to the 43rd Battalion of Egyptian commandos. I couldn't believe my eyes. Seeing the Israeli soldiers waving the white flag and humiliated, though still we treated them very well. The Israeli surrender was a moment of humiliation. Not for me, but when your enemy is so humiliated to the extent that it touches you, that is something. The lieutenant, the commander of the stronghold, saluted our commander, brought down the Israeli flag, folded it, put his gun on it, and handed it to him. He took it and raised the Egyptian flag up high, and they saluted it. I was tearful and so happy, and thinking, oh my God, if I were him, I would kill myself. The surrender of Fort Mazach finally destroyed the myth of the supposedly impregnable Barlev line. These almost medieval forts, which had cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build, had proved useless as Israel's first line of defense. The Egyptians' big advantage over us in the Yom Kippur War was that they didn't lie to themselves regarding how they'd functioned in the Six-Day War, and they fixed what they were capable of fixing. We lied to ourselves about what had happened in the Six-Day War, and now we paid the price. As week one of this October war ended, the streets of Cairo filled with people reveling in their country's military triumphs. Six years of defeat had been reversed. But in week two, triumph would turn to tears.